Hello boys and girls, welcome to another day of learning. Your teachers today are Amanda and Candy. Get ready for another fun episode full of learning. Hi scholars, we're so excited to see you again today. I'm Amanda. And my name is Candy. We have you know who, Rattenboro with us again today. Hi friends, I can't wait to share more about animals with you today. You're in for a special treat today, boys and girls. Rattenboro is gonna talk to us about a special group of animals today. Scholars, we've learned so much about animals together. Tell us what you remember about the word classification. I heard someone say, classifying means to group things together. That's right, we group things together by the way they are alike and taking out the things that are different. Hey, I remember how we've classified some animals already. We learned about two categories, warm-blooded and cold-blooded animals. Wow, Rattenboro, you really were focused. Can you remember what it means for an animal to be warm-blooded or cold-blooded? Of course I do. Warm-blooded animals keep a constant body temperature all the time. Cold-blooded animals have a body temperature that changes with their surroundings. That's it, Rattenboro. Scholars, can you remember which of our friends are cold-blooded? That's right, Tabitha the toad, Paolo the piranha, and Anna the anaconda. Which of our friends are warm-blooded? Hilda the hippo and Ebenezer the egret. Hmm, you know, I'm wondering about all our friends. I know they are all vertebrates because they have spines. Why is a spine so important? Rattenborough, that is a really great question. How about we go over our vocabulary for the lesson? And then we can all learn about why spines are so important to vertebrates. That sounds great. It looks like our first word is cartilage. Cartilage is strong, flexible tissue that usually grows into hard bone in many vertebrates. Tissue? Like what I use when I have a cold? No, Rattenboro, that's tissue paper. This tissue is the material that makes up all of our bodies. Think about a lobster. Lobsters have tough tissue on the outside of their bodies. A lobster is a crustacean. Crustaceans are invertebrates. That tough tissue on the outside of their bodies is called an exoskeleton. Other animals like shrimp and crabs are crustaceans. So, what's an exoskeleton? I'm so glad you asked. An exoskeleton is that tough, rigid outer layer invertebrates have to help protect them and helps to keep them from drying out. A crawfish is another crustacean that has an exoskeleton. Now our next word is nerves. Nerves are parts of the body that send messages to and from the brain through the spinal cord. Oh, I know where the spinal cord is. It's under our spine. Our spine is another word for our backbone. Rattenboro, you've got it. Scholars at home, reach around and feel your spine. It has so many bumps. Candy, I can feel those bumps too. Each one of those bumps is a vertebra. A vertebra is each bone that makes up our backbone or our spine. 
Yes, Rattenboro, you took the word right out of my mouth. Now our last word is slither. Slither is a verb that means to slide smoothly along, often with a slight zigzag pattern. Hmm, slither. That's a word that I would use to describe how a snake moves. Snake! Snakes are predators that eat rats. Eek. You are both right. Snakes do slither candy. And Rattenboro, snakes do eat rats. Luckily for you, we have no snakes here with us today. Since we thankfully don't have to worry about protecting you, how about let's play a game? Okay, I'm ready. So the game is called Fly Around. Candy is going to use the pointer to fly around our words. When she lands on a word, Rattenboro, you say the word. Then scholars at home, when Rattenboro says the word, you echo the word back to him. I'm ready. Here we go. Slither. Cartilage. Spine. Nerves. Crustacean. Exoskeleton. Great job, Rattenboro, and great job to all our scholars at home. Rattenboro, just like I promised, we're going to find out why that spine is so important to vertebrates. Your story is going to tell us all about it. Scholars, are you ready to hear Rattenboro tell us about a story? Great, I am too. Let me clear my voice. <clears throat> All right, here we go for another exciting day of slide, show, and tell. Last time, we classified or grouped animals as cold-blooded and warm-blooded. I am warm-blooded just like you. And how about my friend Hilda Hippo? Yes, Hilda Hippo is also warm-blooded. We all have another characteristic in common too. And that is what we're going to talk about today. We are all vertebrates. Who remembers what a vertebrate is? If you said vertebrates have spines or backbones, you're right. And animals without backbones are called invertebrates. Because you and I are both vertebrates, we'll talk about vertebrates first. Let's take a look at the hippopotamus. What are some ways you could describe a hippo? Wow, interesting descriptions. When you look at the outside of an animal, you can't see the backbone because it's on the inside. But sometimes you can tell where the backbone is. Under a vertebrate skin, there is a ridge. See the line on the back of this animal? The line isn't really on the animal. The line is just showing us where the backbone or spine is. It starts near its head and runs all the way down its back to its tail. Before we go any further, reach around and rub the middle of your back. Remember those bumpy bones we felt a few moments ago? Each bump you feel is a separate vertebra. They form a row from your neck all the way down to your back, all the way to your tailbone. Your spine serves a very important purpose. Your spine protects your spinal cord, that large bundle of nerves that sends messages from your brain to every part of your body. For today, let's take a glimpse at the backbones of the five animal species to which my five friends belong. We've seen that a hippopotamus has a backbone. Now, let's take a look at one of Ebenezer's fellow egrets. 
its backbone, or spinal column, helps it to hold its head up high and protects its spinal cord. Like all egrets, Ebenezer could not live without his backbone. All birds have backbones or vertebra. Whoa, thank goodness this snake is my friend. Snakes don't look like they have backbones, do they? They even look kind of wiggly. Even, so, even though snakes slither or slip and slide along, they absolutely do have backbones. A snake's vertebra, like Anna anacondas, runs the length of its body and swings low to the ground as its muscles help it move along the ground or climb up trees. A pair of ribs is attached to each vertebra, protecting the body parts inside the snake's body. All reptiles have backbones, so you can't always tell from the outside whether an animal is a vertebrate with a spine or whether it's an invertebrate. How about a fish? Would you say a fish has a backbone? Well, the answer is yes. All fish have backbones too, just as reptiles, birds, and mammals do. It's very tricky to see, but if you look at an x-ray of its body, you would see that all the other tiny bones that make up the skeleton of the fish are connected to its spine. Paolo told me that even though all fish have backbones, some fish, like sharks and stingrays, have backbones that are made of lighter and more bendable cartilage instead of a hard bone, allowing them to be more flexible and travel more quickly. I want you to touch the top of one of your ears. Now touch the bottom of that ear. This time touch the tip end of your nose. All of these body parts feel softer because they are made of cartilage instead of bone. Now, that leaves amphibians. Take a look at my animal friend one more time. Pay close attention to the toad right next to Tabitha. It's hard to tell when you look at a toad's body that there is a backbone inside. Now tell me, do toads have backbones? Yes, they certainly do. Toads are vertebrates too. All amphibians have backbones. That means that all five of the animals you've seen today are vertebrates. They all have backbones. The question I'm going to present to you students is this. Do all animals on earth have backbones? Tell me your prediction, boys and girls. Hmm, we know that mammals, which include hippopotami, me, and you, birds, fish, reptiles, and amphibians, are all vertebrates. Haven't we covered all the animal groups on Earth? Aha, trick question. If you said no to both questions, your predictions were correct. Do you remember if there are more vertebrates or more invertebrates on Earth? Good ideas. Look at this image that I shared with you earlier. Remember, more than 95% of all animal species are invertebrates. And insects are the biggest group of invertebrates. And there are still so many invertebrates yet to be discovered and classified. As you can see in the image, Vertebrates are actually only a teeny tiny group here on Earth. Because we tend to think and talk mostly about vertebrates, we sometimes forget that most of the animals in the world are actually invertebrates, and most of those are insects. Think how many insects there must be on our planet. No wonder insects are the most plentiful group of organisms that have ever lived. They make up three quarters of the animal species in the animal kingdom. Can you name a few of the many animals in the insect group? Whoa, I heard some of you say flies. Some said wasps, 
beetles, cockroaches, ladybugs, and butterflies. These are all insects. There are surely a lot more species of insects than there are species of amphibians, mammals, birds, fish, and reptiles all put together. Even though insects are by far the largest group of invertebrates, they are not the only invertebrates. Here's another question for you to think about. Close your eyes and pretend you are a taxonomist for a moment. Can you think of any other animals without backbones? Here's a hint. Instead of internal vertebrae, these animals have an external or outer hard body covering. The largest group of invertebrates is made up of arthropods. Insects make up the largest group of arthropods. Another large group of arthropods includes arachnids. Spiders are arachnids and so are ticks. Daddy long legs and scorpions. Look at the picture showing the main body parts of an insect and an arachnid. Can anyone tell me why insects and arachnids are in different groups? Great discussion. Insects have six legs and three body parts. The ant in this image has a very long antenna. They almost look like legs. In comparison, arachnids have eight legs and two body parts. Instead of having flexible internal skeletons, all of the arthropods wear a tough exoskeleton or protective covering on the outside. I bet you can recognize some of these common examples of insects and arachnids. Now, a crustacean is another kind of invertebrate and also a type of arthropod. Crustaceans have exoskeletons and usually live in water. Interestingly, the word crustaceans comes from the original Latin root crustus, which means hard-shelled ones. Copepods are the smallest of the crustaceans. They are barely visible, but they are a very important source of food or fish in the ocean. Can anyone think of other animals that are classified as crustaceans? Good ideas. Some of the more common crustaceans include shrimp, lobsters, fiddler crabs, and blue crabs. These animals all have a hard exoskeleton, which protects the body and keeps it from drying out. Have you ever seen a crab? Well, if you eat a blue crab, like this one, or a lobster, you have to remove its hard exoskeleton to find the tasty meat inside. Snails, jellyfish, and earthworms are also invertebrates. Other spineless creatures include coral, sea anemones, and sea stars. Many invertebrates are small and hidden and may not even seem like animals, but they are by far the largest group of animals populating the Earth. Phew, what a lot of ways there are to classify animals. In order to study living things, taxonomists classify each organism according to its kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. The purpose of this classification system is to understand each organism better by the characteristics that make it unique. Vertebrates and invertebrates are two types of animals in the world of taxonomy. It is just one way of classifying animals, but I think it is a very helpful way, don't you? You and I may not look alike at all, or much like Ebenezer or Tabitha or Anna, but we all have a very distinct similarity one to another. We all have backbones. Look at this chart that shows how a group of familiar organisms are related to each other. On the top row, you can see a group of living organisms, a house cat, a mountain lion, a tiger, a seal, a turtle, a grasshopper, and a tree. In the next row, titled Kingdom, notice that one of the living organisms is no longer included, the tree. The tree is actually part of a different kingdom. Now, what kingdom does the tree belong to? 
I heard someone say it, the plant kingdom. This road now shows only organisms that are part of the animal kingdom. And the next row, titled phylum, the grasshopper is no longer included because of all the rest of the animals represented here. They are vertebrates, part of the chordata phylum. In looking at the class row, you may notice that the turtle is no longer included because it is in the reptile class, and the other animals are mammals. In the row labeled order, the mouse is not included because it is not a carnivore like the other animals shown. What's true about all the animals in the next row? Family. You're right if you said they're all different types of cats. In the genus row, you can see that the house cat and the mountain lion are more closely related than the tiger. And the very last row represents one specific animal, a species of house cat. This process of starting out with many animals and ending up with just one is called the process of elimination. As we went down the list, we eliminated or removed any animals that no longer had anything in common. Wow, Rattenborough, you shared so much knowledge with us today. Now we know a spine is important to vertebrates because it helps hold us up and helps to protect our spinal cord. Rattenborough, we have some questions for the scholars at home. Would you like to help us with some of these? Oh yeah, let's straighten our spines and get going. All right, boys and girls at home, what is a vertebrate? Scholars, let's hear your answers. If you said animals with backbones, you are precisely right. Rattenborough, what's the spinal cord and why is it so important? Whoa, the spinal cord is the bundle of nerves that is protected by the spine. It is so important because it carries messages to the brain. Perfectly stated. Now, what is that very large group of animals that's not classified as vertebrates? Oh, I know this one too. Insects. Ding, ding, ding. That's the group. Scholars, what are they classified as instead and why? I heard someone say invertebrates. That's it. And yes, they are classified as invertebrates because they don't have backbones. Expert. Scholars, we've had so much fun learning with you today. Yes, and Rattenborough, thank you for learning with us and sharing what you know about vertebrates and invertebrates. My pleasure. Let's get back together soon and learn some more. I like that idea. Until next time. Thank you, Amanda and Candy. All rights and credits for today's lesson belong to Core Knowledge Language Arts. We would like to thank them for publicly sharing these valuable resources. The views and opinions expressed in this lesson are those of the Core Knowledge authors and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the Mississippi Department of Education. Thank you again, Amanda and Candy. Thank you for joining us today, boys and girls. We will see you next time. Goodbye. Bye. Bye-bye.